Hello, uh, welcome to our webinar series, our summer webinar series. This is Craig Kennedy with ACU. This is our second webinar series of the year. Um, and I am very pleased to have Fred Rockman of the Alliance of Chicago here with us um, to present on thriving as a learning healthcare system in primary care. Um, before I send it over to Fred, I just wanna give a couple of opening introductions about the webinar series and ACU in general. ACU is a national nonprofit organization focused on the recruitment and retention of clinicians in underserved areas. Obviously, that's our name. <laughs> we do that through projects like the Star Center, through our National Health Service Corps advocacy, and putting out training and resources for clinicians of all different types. Uh, supporting this work is what we're really founded to do. So if there's something that might be helpful as we go forward that you can think of that ACU can do to be more helpful for clinicians in the field, please let us know. Uh, we really hope that ACU will be a learning resource for you and, and really help improve care for our underserved communities across the country and be part of your continuing education activities um, as you go forward as a clinician in an underserved community. So we really, really look forward to helping you um, succeed and stay, be part of those communities that really need your help and really appreciate the, the honor of helping you stay there. We're, um, we are sponsored today by the Centene Corporation, who has sponsored this for several years now, our webinar series, our quality webinar series, our summer webinar series. Uh, the way we talked to them about it was we would do a webinar series on the highest rated um, sessions from our annual conference. That way we knew that we had good presenters and we had good topics and interesting topics, and that is exactly what this webinar series is. And Centene has been very, um, friendly in their partnership with us to get this in a manner that we're very proud of and we hope they're very proud of as well as we go forward. So thank you to Centene Corporation for their support for this webinar series and for ACU in general. Today, um, the organizers are me, you, as you're listening to me, the Executive Director Greg Kennedy. That's my email address on the screen right now. Um, also with me is our staffer, Mariah Blake who's our program manager. She's the uh, smart technical one on the phone call today. And so that's her email address and the phone number. If something is goes wrong or you have a question about the structure, technical aspects, or you can't hear me, but it would be hard to ask a question because if you can't hear me, you don't have to hear me say this, but um, you can email Mariah directly or you can type things over on the, um, in the, in the questions or the chat box over on the right hand side, any of those will work. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me or Mariah Blake at any time. We're happy to help you now or in the future as we go forward, as we discuss. Um, we are recording this webinar. So um, while we appreciate you guys being on the line, one of the, one of the benefits of being on the line is that you get to ask questions of our, our presenter, Dr. Rockman. Um, however, you can listen to this later. We will be posting it on our website. It goes out to everybody in the world. So um, feel free to, you can take notes as you go along, but we are recording it and we will be sending it out to you so that you have those. We also um, will be offering one CME credit for today's webinar. We have put in an application with AAFP. So if you want CME credit for our webinar series, please send an email to Mariah Blake. Remember that back one, one slide where Mariah Blake's email, mblake at clinicians.org. So if you send an email to Mariah Blake saying, yes, I would like CME, we obviously have all the information here we need about um, your attendance. So I'm happy to apply for CME, one CME credit for this webinar series, for this webinar today, four, of course, for our webinar series. And also please ask questions. Um, <laughs> The whole purpose of doing it in this manner is to have you interact with the presenter and the subject topic and be able to ask questions. So you can raise your hand, right? You can click on that little button that has your little hand on it and you can raise your hand. Um, you can tap, type it into the question box, type it into the chat box, wherever you put it. We will find those questions or you can just email Mariah or me, it doesn't matter. Um, we'll find those questions and get them to Dr. Rockman at the end of this presentation. Um, however, if it's something pressing right in the middle, um, maybe we'll try to badger him during it, but 
would let him get through his presentation and then try to do questions at the end. But please, throughout the presentation, feel free to type in those questions so that when we get to the end, we can actually have those questions ready to go. But so use the chat box, use the question box, raise your hand however you'd like to do it. Um, but please ask questions. That's the whole point of this, which is an interactive activity uh, where you get to ask questions and have them answered. Um, also, please stick around to the end of the um, end of the webinar. We have an evaluation form where we'd love to have your feedback directly, of course. But it also has an opportunity to say what other topics you'd like to see, what other things you'd like to have ACU present on, or or get more information to you about. So. The evaluation at the end is obviously an evaluation for our purposes as well, but it also gives an opportunity to hear from you what other things you'd like to hear from us. So please stick around to the end. Um, Dr. Rockman will give a presentation, we'll go through questions, and then there'll be an evaluation at the end. So um, with that, I will now turn it over to Dr. Fred Rockman, who is a longtime friend of mine. My introduction will be um, I could read his introduction, but I'm sure you can look him up online as well. But Fred Rockman has been a longtime friend of mine, a true visionary in the health center world and network space. Um, he is the CEO of the Alliance of Chicago and has been since I've known him. But, but more than that, um, he actually practices at a community health center and a hospital and has firsthand knowledge of the clinical space, of the health center space, and of the network and IT space. So he really is an expert on all of the different moving pieces on uh, team-based care, on how to care for populations that we know need access to care. And Fred, at the end of the day, is just a truly nice guy. <laughs> so um, I appreciate being affiliated in any way, shape, or form with Dr. Fred Rockman. And I am really looking forward to this presentation, Fred. Um, and thank you very much for your time. Well, uh, Craig, thank you so much. The feeling is completely mutual. Um, before we, uh, oops, just getting the hang of this uh, technology here. Bear with me. Um, so uh, thank you, Craig. And you know, what I'd say is in keeping with the theme, what I feel happy about is life's given me the opportunity to be part of a learning uh, system, a learning process. So. Um, this talk today is a reprise of a talk I gave at the ACU conference last year. I'm really honored to be able to spend this time with you today and to reprise the talk. And what I can say is um, the votes must have been very close, Craig, because the, the uh, conference is awesome. Uh, I hope I'll see many of you at the conference that's coming up this summer because it is uh, as a reflection of the uh, organization an incredible uh, opportunity for us to gather as uh, stakeholders in underserved uh, uh, healthcare, and so uh, you know, um, I'm hoping this will be a teaser for many of you to attend that conference. Um, I want to start out. It's a little, all a little awkward on a webinar to understand who's out there. So Mariah has uh, uh, graciously um, assisted in putting up a little. Uh, poll so I can understand who is a uh, part of the audience today. So if you could quickly just respond to this poll, it'll help us all see who we are today. So the first question is, you know, what is your main role uh, in your healthcare organization? Are you primarily involved in clinical care or I uh, would include quality improvement in that, administration or finance? Are you primarily engaged in research or education? Are you a policy advocacy person? And apologize, I don't want to slight other areas of, of function, but we only had five choices, so there's an other box. Great, so it looks like we have a, a nice mix. Of course, I'd love to understand who all the, what the other roles on are, but it looks like we do have a, a predominance of uh, clinical care providers and others involved in uh, supporting care. And we do have a smattering of some people with research and policy, so that's fantastic. So then my next quick question is what the main area of a clinical focus that you have is. So we have one more question for you. Um, is your primary focus on, you know, uh, what we would, broadly view as medical services, uh, or behavioral health, dental, social service or enabling, and again, other, and again, apologies, it was not to slight anything that's not in the first four categories, but we only had five choices.
We should have some quiz show music, shouldn't we? I know. We should have some. <laughs> Great. Okay, so predominantly medical and other. Maybe some of you from the other could type into the chat box what you do, because I'd love to know uh, what's not covered. And, um, you know, I will, so uh, it's, it's valuable to know that the primary focus of the people on the call is medical, although uh, uh, part of the point of the talk is going to be that all should be in. But so um, the, the focus of the talk, they're hoping uh, what we would get through, sorry. This is very twitchy. Uh, what we're trying, hoping to get through is, you know, understanding what the fundamental principles of a learning healthcare system are, and how that is actually relevant for us, not only relevant for us in our health centers, but why we should be thinking about it as engaging the entire team in an era where we're all focused on team-based care. Um, discuss a few examples of learning healthcare system principles adopted in, in care for underserved, and, and then understand how implementing the learning healthcare system can be relevant uh, for work we're doing in preparing our primary care teams for payment reform. So just a quick word about Alliance. Um, as Craig intimated, we're a health center controlled network. We've been focused at the center of the slide, as you can see, on health information technology. We've always viewed that as a means to an end that supports the other things we do as a network. Uh, on the right, health research and education, so using all of the benefits, both the platform and the data that accrues from it uh, to better understand what's going on and help inform how we do planning and program design and uh, become more responsive uh, uh, in our healthcare services, but, and also as feeding uh, healthcare collaboration, a variety of clinical kinds of things we do um, as a group of health centers. Our mission is to improve personal, uh, uh, community, and public health through uh, creative collaboration. So that's us, and that slide is kind of, if you keep that in the background of your mind, we really have tried to pattern the organization after the learning health system, and hopefully that'll begin to uh, make sense to you as we uh, go through. So I wanna start today with a story. So this is a picture of a family practitioner, a colleague who practiced uh, in the Chicago area um, named Mike Raycotts. And Mike was a thoughtful guy, and in the course of his practice, he did what happens very often in our health centers. He would see patients who had an elevated blood pressure, and it's like one elevated blood pressure. What do I do with that? Um, and am I going to commit, or is my patient going to buy into the fact that they have hypertension and begin that route, or do we need to like validate that that's not just an isolated observation? So. Um, he would tell them, you know, your blood pressure is a little high today. I'd like you to come back and we'll take it again and see what it, what's there and whether we need to go further with it. And so as he was doing it one day, a question came into his head and he said, how many of the patients that I have this elevated blood pressure that I'm telling you to come back actually had high blood pressure and they never get diagnosed either because they never came back or somebody forgot that it was elevated before and we keep telling them that. So how many patients with these single elevated blood pressure measurements are we missing? And Mike was fortunate to work in a very forward thinking organization that had this program where clinicians with questions like that could be gifted, granted uh, the wish of working with a, uh, a team that had access to clinical informatics and had access to how to frame a question properly in order to get an answer to it that was valid. And lo and behold, what happened was that they discovered that actually a very, very large percentage of patients um, were actually not being recognized as having hypertension. And hopefully all of you on the call realize the uh, significance of undiagnosed hypertension. And actually, based on the work that Mike did, uh, he actually now is a full-time researcher. He works with the AMA. It led to a whole series of questions and, inter and, and sort of interventional kinds of uh, studies that have led us to advance how well we're doing at uh, recognizing hypertension and taking appropriate action. So keep that story in mind because that story is really an illustration of the idea of the learning health system. And the learning health system really is a simple, it looks almost to those of you that are familiar with QI, it looks a little bit like the QI wheel 
what it says is we start, we could start anywhere on the wheel, but let's start with care delivery. In the process of care, we're making observations, which if we capture that in the right way as data, could help feed and advance knowledge and insights that then could be translated back into care so that we have a continuous feedback uh, loop. And this is really, in essence, what the learning health system is. And in the middle of this slide, you see the fact that that community involves patients, clinicians, and communities if we buy into the community health center model in which uh, we, uh, we most of us work. Um, and so uh, we want to make sure that when we build this learning health system, we have opportunities for all of those stakeholders to be engaged. And we're fortunate in this day and age to live in an era where that kind of interaction and inclusion, as well as the, the seamless cycle, is enabled by health information technology. We've made a tremendous investment as a uh, nation in health information technology. More than 99% of practices actually today are using electronic health records. And while there are challenges with that, it at least uh, provides the opportunity uh, that we can utilize that system to advance this cycle. And so that's what we're really going to be talking about in, in various aspects for the rest of the conversation. So the, the, um, the expression in healthy people, 20, I am so sorry, this slide is uh, presentation uh, technology is a little twitchy on my computer. Uh, so this vision is reflected in Healthy People 2020 um, goals in this particular goal that appears in that document, that 90% of clinical decisions by 2020 would be supported by, act, uh, by timely, accurate, and up-to-date clinical information and reflect the best available evidence. And so given that we're in 2018, um, we have to pull a rabbit out of a hat to get quite to 90%, uh, but definitely this is what a lot of the efforts nationally are focused on. So here is kind of a little bit of more of a schematic, a more enriched view of that learning health system wheel that we saw. I'll just walk through this uh, uh, briefly, and then we'll go on to talk about what does this look like practically as we're trying to approach it. So, so you know, the simple, again, uh, elevator speech for what a learning health system is. I love this really quick statement. And a learning health system, evidence informs practice and practice informs evidence. And so you can see these, you know, a little bit more refinement of those points on the wheel where we're designing healthcare, uh, we're implementing it, we have some way that we're evaluating or collecting data from it. That's allowing us to adjust it and feeding in then to ongoing design. And these arrows in and out indicate how we can engage the broader stakeholder community, scientists, researchers, policy people, all of those, to be reacting to the data and the observations we're having and being part of feeding back in improvements that we introduce in the system. So the title of the talk includes team-based care, and uh, this slide shouldn't be should be familiar to all of you. We know that that's sort of the the uh, buzz of the day is team-based care, and a lot of investment uh, on the part of major funders and our health centers, and um, it's beginning to become more and more a requirement or something that's being looked at by uh, those who pay for health care. This idea that um, good health care, the notion of good health care in 2018 involves that we're not working individually or in isolated or siloed ways, um, but that we have patient-centered care teams in which we're taking the responsibility to coordinate all of the uh, services and disciplines and the, the uh, roles within the health center in, uh, in delivering care. So, um, again, health information technology, sorry, I did go in too quickly again. Uh, health information technology has the opportunity to help us with this, and I'm going to spend uh, a little bit of time thinking about that by looking at each of these steps along the cycle. So the transition from care to data, the transition from data to knowledge, and the transition from knowledge back into care. 
So let's start with care into data. So uh, this, sorry, this slide um, just is a really good visual to remind us that de de working with healthcare data is really difficult because it's so complex, because we're coming from a paper era where we had our own notions of what was important to capture and how, and uh, we have struggled with how to utilize more um, uh, structured or, or mandated ways of recording information. We're still very much in a learning curve about how to do that. And healthcare data in itself, just by its own nature, is very, very complex and very broad. So if we're trying to have an accurate way to capture the care we're delivering in data, it's really, really important to recognize how difficult it is and explains a lot of the struggle and disappointments we have right now. And one plea would be to just remember that it's difficult and therefore we have a long way to go. And as we uncover you know, challenges or weaknesses or disappointments that we plug away, that we keep in mind why it's important that we hang in there and figure it out. So where are some of these data sources, you know, just to punch up this complexity, but also understand what all of the uh, areas that we need to consider are. So first of all, there is the electronic health record system data, and there is a wealth of data in the electronic health uh, system uh, about the care that we're providing within uh, the scope of our primary care practice. And keep in mind, though, that we also have to contemplate that as our consumers move to other care settings. They then have data that is sitting in other EHRSs, and we're still, again, very early in figuring out how to meaningfully import relevant data across those different EHRs. There's claims and enrollment data, which is also significant because it gives us a lot of important clues and information on services that are being uh, received by our patients, and it's also something that we need to figure out because, or factor in because it also tells us what resources our uh, patients have to work with. There's pharmacy data, of course. There are these uh, ADT or admission discharge transfer alerts. So this is not just having information from other healthcare institutions, but it's having timely alerts when some significant contact is happening outside of our own practice that we need to be aware of. There's public health data and that uh, data at population level is very important in terms of the context in which we need to think about uh, providing care to an individual. We'll touch a little bit on that later. There's uh, increasing recognition that our patients themselves have uh, increasing opportunities to provide data directly into us, and that that may turn out to be one of the most important and valuable sources of information that we have, and we're still pretty early in figuring out ways uh, not only to enable our patients to provide that information to us, but how to incorporate that into our database. There's precision medicine data, and uh, uh, hopefully all of you are aware that we're beginning to recognize that um, other factors, other than uh, just what's presented to us, um, uh, based on certain characteristics that we see from the medical arena are very uh, significant in terms of us understanding what are right uh, recommendations or right interventions for an individual. Mostly these, are, these have focused on today genetics. Um, but if, uh, and we'll talk about this later, there are other important individualized aspects that we need to take into account if we want to tailor you know, broad population-based uh, recommendations to fit an individual. And social determinants of health, I would put into that arena. Um, um, we're really, uh, it's really gratifying to see that most parts of the healthcare system today are waking up to what we've always known as providers of services to underserved, which is that many, many other of the uh, aspects of uh, our, our uh our consumers, our, our patients, um, things that they're dealing with in the social determinants realm, uh, environmental, uh, as well as personal, psychosocial, and behavioral, are, turn out to be very, very significant.
So um, the other thing I just want to recognize is what's happening in technology. When we think of sources of data, it's sort of exploding because we used to uh, contemplate only information that we knew was collected within our own institution or uh, coming from other institutions. But more and more, we're having the marketing of direct-to-consumer uh, dev devices, meaning that we need to be mindful of the fact that uh, this is coming quicker than any of us imagined, that medical data, even medical data, is going to come to us from an increasingly uh, broad set of uh, uh, origins. Okay, so this is, I just want to punch up uh, some of the point, the point that we made about social determinants. So right now, um, we know that 50% of last year's high cost uh, patients spent less than $5,000 in the previous year. And most of our efforts today in the, in the larger healthcare arena are spent on those high cost claimants. It's not spent on identifying who are the ones today that are invisible in terms of expenses that next year will be part of the problem. So if we really want to get ahead of it, we need to understand what is under the iceberg. And what's under the iceberg are all of the things that feed and determine our health trajectories. And these are, again, if, you, if we, we think about it, we know the medical parts of it, but these are all the hidden pieces that are under these, that underlie um, uh, how, uh, what our health trajectory is going to look like. Things like our own personal health practices, our social support networks, our access to uh, food, nutrition, transportation, education, gender. You know, health services is only one small piece of what's under that iceberg. And so um, if we're really trying to, uh, as a health center, as a learning health system, uh, ensure that we have all of the right inputs and all of the right database, we need to be mindful of how we're incorporating all of these important aspects. This is an example uh, for you of what happens when you start to incorporate some of this other information from other arenas. So this is public health data. It's up open data here in Chicago that we uh, pulled and accessed and were able to intersect with our um, with our other data that we use for clinical care. And knowing that some of those things under the iceberg are important for us to contemplate, um, knowing what is the context in which a, an individual that we're trying to care for is operating is very, very helpful as we're trying to assess their risk beyond just what their numbers say. Okay, so that was a little teaser on observation into uh, d uh, data. Uh, let's go to the data into generation of knowledge now. So when we think about that uh, transition, the, the challenge that we're facing today is actually not um, the lack of availability of data. Those of us that come from the paper era remember that it was very, very time consuming and laborious to, ch to collect data uh, on paper and with chart audits. So we were pretty, pretty thoughtful. We had a we had a, a natural lens. We were only collecting data where we had a real purpose or how to use it or what we were intending, what question we were intending to answer. Well, now we're in the age where we have so much data. We have so much data that as that accumulates and rises, it's, it's almost bewildering, it's overwhelming. And so the problem becomes less on how do we get the data and more on how do we use or understand the data? What is it telling us and how is it helping inform uh, decisions uh, that we're making? And so uh, I just want to go through then um, some examples of how we ex organize all this data. And again, as we do that, I want to keep, I uh, want to make sure that we're all remembering that that data in order to be most useful needs to contemplate all the sources that may be relevant. So unfortunately, we're not anymore uh, able to just focus on what's within our own walls, but we need to think through how is data from outside our institution also important in answering some of these questions or gaining insights. 
So let's go through a couple use cases and think about what kinds of data are useful or what kinds of data do we need to incorporate in order to gain these insights. So many of us are involved in the need for risk stratification. And the idea, the idea here is to identify patients at risk for certain adverse outcomes uh, again, who are these high utilizers in the future, and appropriately intervene in a timely manner. And it's also important for us in terms of how we use limited resources and target them the best way. So what are some of the data sources we would need for this? So we have claims data, obviously. That's helpful uh, with the caveat that I mentioned that some of these, some of our significant stakeholders may not yet be appearing in the claims data. Um, we have our EMR data. We have pharmacy or medication data. We have the public health data, as I gave you that little teaser, some factors of the environment in which uh, certain people reside may be significant. Um, we have social determinants data, and uh, we have uh, patient reported outcomes data. And you may think of others, but this is just at, at the least a minimum list of sources of data that need to be incorporated if we're trying to build a database to think about risk stratification. Provider empanelment. So this is important for us to understand how can we um, make sure uh, that we're promoting the goal of continuity of care. We all recognize that if we can have more of a connection uh, between a primary care provider and a patient or a family, and that that's maintained over time, that the care will be better. Uh, so how do we make that match? And in the era of managed care, it's also important because we need to understand um, how many patients can we assign to a particular provider? Are we balancing it so it becomes a reasonable workload, et cetera? So in order to do this, um, we need to know, we need to have some understanding of the claims that are occurring that gives us some insights into patterns of utilization. We need enrollment files, and that could be anything from enrollment files just within our health center or it might include enrollment uh, with certain contracts with certain payers, uh, so we understand those obligations. It uh, involves, again, some patient reported outcomes so we can better understand needs of our patients and how well we're needing our patients, and of course, EMR data. Again, this is just to get you thinking about you know, how there has to be a broad net of data sources and how to begin to think about what's needed in order to uh, uh, have the information needed for of supporting certain kinds of decisions or processes. What about a population health, if we're trying to take that on? So in this one, a, a, an example of a goal might be that we wanna identify gaps in care in order to deploy appropriate interventions in a timely manner. How are we doing with some of these evidence-based goals or uh, you know, some of the ones that are given to us, like HEDIS measures or uh, UDS measures. And the sources here, again, uh, are we always uh, tend to think of our EMR, but if we really want to have a clear picture of what are, what's going on, some of that data comes from outside, claims data, because some of these elements of care may be received in other settings. And or if we're trying to make the point to a payer that we actually have addressed the gaps in care, we may uncover some services that actually were delivered but are not appearing in the claims database, so therefore our key stakeholder does not recognize that in fact those gaps were met. Um, pharmacy data, uh, again, uh, this is uh, one of the promises of e-prescribing is that we can close the loop uh, on what's happening with these prescriptions we write. Are they being filled? Um, uh, are refills being uh, done? Or are there other sources of medication that we don't know about that we should know about um, in terms of uh, uh, the, the care plan for our patients? Patient reported outcomes, again, um, and uh, public health data, again, uh, useful in understanding context. ED or hospital utilization, many of us are now onto this thing because everybody is uh, holding us responsible as primary care providers for oh, what's considered overuse of emergency rooms or revolving door admissions in hospitals. And here again, we need to have sources of data that bridge way beyond our own EMR and would include other EMRs and of course, uh, those critical 
alert. So not only we're not finding out from claims after the fact that our population has visited a hospital or ER, but we're knowing it in real time, so we have some hope of beginning to intervene. Total cost of care. This one is really, really important, I think, for us to contemplate. Um, it's something that maybe as a, a primary care practices we have not taken on before. We've been, you know, very, very attendant to the scope of service that we provide within our walls. Um, but more and more, we're held accountable for that total cost of care dollar. And it's important for two reasons. One is it's important for us in order to evaluate how effective what we're doing is downstream uh, in terms of the uh, health trajectory uh, of our patients. But it's also important for us if we're going to advocate for the value of interventions that we're doing, we need to be able to uh, com we need to be able to evaluate those in interventions or make the point that they are impacting total cost of care. So remember that early slide of the iceberg. If we want to convince stakeholders that are so focused on the current high utilize of care that things we're doing earlier are, are offsetting people appearing then later on in those cost of care. We need to be able to make that point. Otherwise, those efforts will not be recognized. All right, so those were just some examples of like what's in front of us right now. But of course, the world is evolving in very, very exciting ways. So beyond those kinds of manual ways that we're looking at data and producing views that can help inform our decisions, we're living into an era where machines can actually help us. And we don't even have to pose some of these questions manually, but they can be, they can be asked for us in an automated fashion. Everybody knows about uh, IBM Watson and how it's beginning to exceed the capabilities of the human brain, even well-trained clinicians. And uh, lest anyone here think I'm you know, one of these people who think we're all going to be replaced by a computer, I think what we're going to punch up is the value of where is the human brain and the human interaction and those sites important uh, as an augment to the power of machine learning. But it would be a very big mistake to dismiss this because it really is uh, the wave of the future. And just for to, to, to understand exactly how important uh, that machine learning is, um, when we, if you pull apart a model in Watson that would predict the likelihood of a patient developing diabetes within the next year, the model that eventually was developed through the machine learning includes six, in more than 16,000 rules, some of which are these simple things that we might think of as human beings, but those are just a few. Those are just a few among 16,000 rules. And so it's impossible to think that we as human beings could process information at that level of sophistication. And so the point there is why it is, uh, back to the original slide, important for us to be putting our efforts um, into making sure that we're capturing all the data because um, these rules are developed based on what data is available. And they don't include just to be clear, they don't include today some of those important social factors or social determinants that we all know are important. There is a roadmap for it includes the genetics, but I think we still are way off from considering how it could incorporate some of the social determinants related issues that we know are based on the people that we take care of are important. So let's uh, complete the circle now of those insights and knowledge being translated back into care. And um, one of the, by and large, one of the main uh, ways that we see this occurring is through electronic health records, embedded clinical decision support. And um, this particular one, relevant to our initial story, is one um, that is a translation of Dr. Ray Kotz's algorithm uh, into uh, an automated way to prompt the provider, hey, wait a minute, this patient now, it's not an isolated observation anymore. They now have uh, enough observations that this is someone that has uh, hypertension. And in fact, this kind of clinical decision support can also be run at population level. So we could run against our population uh, this kind of algorithm and identify a set of patients who we haven't recognized that need to be called in. 
So clinical decision support is very, very powerful, and I want to spend a little bit of time on that because it's one of the main ways, ways that we translate those insights back into practice. In clinical decision support is both a functionality, so that slide I just showed you is based on some capabilities of software and analytics and all of those things, but it is also most importantly a process for how we take advantage of those gorgeous uh, capabilities and use it actually in practice. And uh, Jerry Ashraf, if you don't know Jerry, is uh, really has been uh, a, an a, amazing mind in this area and developed this concept of the five rights of clinical decision support. I hope many of you are familiar with it, so, but bear with me for uh, level setting the group to make sure that everyone is familiar with it. It really is kind of the paperclip for clinical decision support. It's very simple, and when you look at it, it's very obvious, but that is what's so elegant about it. And what it says is that when we think of effectively utilizing clinical decision support capabilities, we need to think about five things. We need to make sure, first of all, of course, obviously, that we're providing the right information. But secondly, we're providing it in the right format. Uh, so we're um, providing it in the terms of, um, you know, in a way that is digestible and usable by people in the care process. And of course, it needs to be to the right people, the right members of the care team who can use that or can, can, are actually involved in the decision or uh, arriving at the decision with the patient. And it has to be recognizing that there's more than one channel, so not just an EMR. In our previous example, it could be in a population health tool um, it could be anywhere. It could be in the practice management system. It could be in a text messaging system. It could be anywhere uh, in terms of channel. And of course, it has to be at the right time. And here we need to recognize that the right time more and more is not just in the context of a visit. A clinic visit represents a very, very small percentage of the time in the life of our patients. So we need to be contemplating how that decision support spreads out um, over our entire uh, 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 patient's trajectory. I do want to emphasize again this right person in keeping with the theme of our talk because the right person means everyone in the care team. So it's not just the clinician or the physician or nurse practitioner or even the behavioral health or dentist. It's everyone on the care team. You know, our front desk staff, our medical assistants, um, anyone on the care team. And of course, we also need to always keep in mind that we're not doing this to our patients, we're doing this with our patients. So I, I hope that we include that as we're thinking about how to you know, position the data to be actionable. So I wanna end by just reflecting a little bit on uh, what's going on in our environment and how that, uh, impacts how we think about uh, taking some of this and translating it into our everyday work. So first of all, let's just quickly reflect some of the things that are going on in the environment. So we talked about precision medicine and more and more we're looking at not having just blanket population level recommendations, but we're talking about them being more tailored to aspects of an individual so that they're more, uh, more targeted and more reflected of their needs. Um, we are having the, what we could call a colossal clash. So there is a proliferation of direct-to-consumer solutions uh, that are changing the face of how we and our consumers are thinking about healthcare. Um, and I hope everyone is contemplating this because it used to be that we had the keys to the kingdom and now the kingdom is more democratized. And so the more devices come up, the more uh, online tools and apps and things become available to consumer, the more we need to recognize uh, that this is shared. Um, more of a recognition that we can't just think in an isolated way about our own piece in the journey of health, but we need to think about how that fits, what we do fits in the larger journey. Care everywhere. Uh, or care anywhere, <laughs> uh, you could do it either way. But you know, technology enabling the ability of care to be delivered in any setting, 
uh, that's just going to keep uh, that envelope is going to keep being pushed. And just think about anything else in your life and how it works today with your mobile devices and home devices. So that's happening in healthcare, and that's feeding consumer expectations that more and more are asking the question: Why does healthcare look so different from everything else I do? And as Amazon and Apple and CVS and others enter the care field, they've got it. They realize their consumers want a different experience. A high deductible world. So more and more we're seeing shifting of responsibility for payment to consumers, meaning they're going to be more and more engaged and thoughtful about how um, what the cost is of ways that we're uh, in, in, uh, pitching to them. New entrants. So uh, again, as I, as I uh, reference, we have new players entering the healthcare fields. There's an explosion of data, we talked about that. And there's new ways that we're gathering data, new sensing options. Um, and then this last one, for those of you who might be finance people here, more and more we're looking at um, solutions that are cloud-based, that are not relied on flying on physical uh, equipment, meaning for us as health centers, the opportunity to use grant funds and capital you know, uh, gifts to pay for things. Um, those opportunities are going to decrease in favor of needing to pay for things on a, well, as operating expenses. So just some things to keep in mind. So we have this very, very complex set of healthcare reform uh, activities going on, all aimed at improving quality, lowering cost. And the strategies from Health and Human Services were to improve the way we pay for services, to incentive quality versus quantity to improve uh, care delivery through the mechanisms that we talked about. And, you know, really this uh, learning health system is uh, very, very reflective of where HHS is going. And then making data more available uh, and more uh, um, interoperable so we have data flowing across the entire system. So um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just reflecting that um, there are, there is a journey from fee for service with no link to quality all the way through to full on managed care where folks are paid for population. And in between there is, you know, there are a couple steps toward there. And what I'd say is by and large, we in health centers and underserved centers are still largely in the fee for service. We may be getting some quality uh, payment. Um, and we may be participating in managed care efforts where we're getting a little bit tiny share of the uh, savings. Uh, but by and large, we're still in a fee-for-service world. And um, when we look up uh, at, at the high level, though, more and more is being shifted to these alternative payments towards Category 4. And it's been a rapid shift. If you look even from 2016 to 2018, a big um, growth uh, in the pie. So, um, and this slide gets confusing to people. They're not, they're cumulative, not additive. So, you, you know, if you're adding 50 to 90, the 50 is of the total and the 90 is of the total. Um, so, um, what I, to, to finish up, I just want to uh, make sure that people are aware of as we shift to managed care, um, the, the way that we get paid and the way we improve revenue changes. So under fee-for-service, we've been incentivized simply to think about throughput. How many patients are we seeing per provider? How many patients are we doing a day? We really have not been incentivized around some of the things we've talked about earlier, which is getting at being more effective, more consumer sensitive, and uh, improving uh, the care we're delivering and the outcomes. There's no incentive there. And even when we get to simply a capitated payment at a primary care level, now we've shifted from visits to patients. It could conceivably make things worse if we're overloading our providers with lots of patients, but we really haven't shifted uh, the methodology underneath that in which we get paid. It's really not until we get to really significant quality incentives where we're actually getting incentivized for quality or really get deep into managed care where we now have a stake out of the total healthcare dollar uh, and the savings that we can redeploy as we see fit, that we're able to attend to uh, some of the interventions that we know are important if we're trying to move the needle. 
The reason why I think it's important for us as health centers to take this on is in these next two slides. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> I gave you the teaser there too far. Okay, so everybody is aware of this. People always talk about how the United States spends more than, you know, there we are at the uh, left side of the curve, two and a half times the average uh, if we look globally uh, on healthcare and our outcomes are so terrible and therefore we're spending too much health money on healthcare. But are we really? Because if we look at the next slide and we look at total healthcare investment, which includes not only what we pay for medical services, but we pay for all of the related healthcare services, we can see that the United States is actually not at the top of the curve. We're somewhere down, you know, in the middle. And what's even worse, and maybe the insight is why we have the worst ratio of healthcare expenditures to outcomes is look at the ratio. It is the worst in the world. We spend more on healthcare relative to social services than anyone else. And if we look at the, some of the countries that do really well, uh, you can notice that their ratio is much more, in many cases, spending even more on social determinants they do on medical care. And so I think we as health centers are very, very uh, well positioned to be making and demonstrating this point, and we can do this within the structure of the learning health system. So, whoops. So I'm just going to leave you uh, with a. Sorry, keep going. Uh, this these stages of change and contemplation, because I know at the beginning of the slide, the learning health system may have seemed like some kind of abstract thing, and well, that sounds nice, and maybe we could do it. Um, I hope I've made it a little bit more practical for you, and I've also made you a te teased you a little bit in some points of the talk about why we. Um, as health centers, and particularly if we think broadly about health and who's involved in our healthcare teams, why it's really, really important for us to lean forward into this and to move ourselves along the uh, the uh, stages of change and uh, and uh, be active parts of a learning healthcare system. So with that, I'll leave you uh, with just some uh, some resources that you can use and open for questions. All right. Thanks, Fred. Um, I do want to encourage folks to type in questions in the box. We're happy to ask them. I will be honest with you, Fred. I have about three hours worth of questions to ask you on that presentation. Um, but I do want to just get it started by saying, um, from your perspective, um, I think looking at the, okay, so, so say I was at section three. So, okay, what do I do now perspective? Your a network. There are networks, there are user groups, there are, I understand that data is important. I get it. I understand there are a bunch of different data things. I understand it's all driving towards a specific goal. What do I do now? Um, should I look for my network? Should I look to a user group? Should I look to the vendor? What's my next step as a provider um, or as a, uh, actually we had a couple, we have some PCAs, we have some uh, care coordinators. You asked about what other types of folks we have on the line. Um, so from a bunch of different perspectives, what's their next step? What's their number three on your little thing? So, okay, what do I do now? Call my network, call my provider, call my call my, uh, my IT manager, depending on how big my center is. What's my next step? So it's a great question, Craig. And what I'd say is yes. Everybody. Okay. I mean, that's part of the point about the team. And I, you know, I would include, I, I'm realizing it wasn't on the slide, but I include all those people. I include uh, people in who are uh, over network collaborations or PCAs or other kinds of stakeholders. We're all part of this community. And think of the story I started with. I'd say the place to start is with the question, right? As you're looking at whatever your scope of focus is at healthcare that's being provided. What questions occur to you? What do you think is significant and might be significant? What kind of data is needed to answer that question or give you more information? And then what might, you know, how might that then equip you to make a difference? I think it has to happen at every single level. The beauty of the healthcare system, you know, learning healthcare system, it operates at every level. You could operate at the level of just even a single care team within an organization, or it can operate in terms of the U.S. healthcare system. Hmm. 
Wow. That did, okay. My mind just blew there on the, the size and scope, but um, actually AC. So what, did it blow in a good way or in a yeah, confused way. way? No, no. I was like, wow, that, yes, you're right. I just need to give it some thought about the whole scale of it. So um, I do want to reconfirm for folks that ACU in our STAR Center is a data-driven approach to address what we call recruitment and retention, but, but it really is a data-driven approach, exactly what Dr. Rockman is going through here, a data-driven approach to answer those questions in that first example that he spoke about. Um, what was it? High blood pressure. Um, so looking at your patient, looking at the data, looking at what is happening in your practice is so important to this entire topic, right? It could, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, in theory this and theory that, but boy, health centers have some, have just a ton of data. And what Fred has said here today is there's a lot of data and even more than you may not have even seen some of these claims data, some of these other things that need to be integrated into that decision-making process. So um, very much appreciate the, the data-driven approach um, and for folks that are looking through the STAR Center, we do do a, a one pager on every health center, a profile, and have a lot of resources for you to address some of the clinical recruitment retention sides, but what he's talking about is broader than that. Um, let me ask you this on the, on the future. You spoke about a lot of moving pieces up front, which is um, integrating that data to address the challenges, the specific challenges of the health center. Um, and I wanted to go back to your slide. Do I have the power to go back in slides? I don't even know if I'm the, am I a slide person? Can I go back to the double circle, the one that you said was confusing? I think that is a fascinating chart, actually. Um, back, I don't know, four or five slides, the double circles where you said it was cumulative, not, you know, uh, oh. isolation. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That I think is incredibly an incredibly important slide, this one, because yeah. what, what you're talking about here is the move away from, you know, just process, but to outcomes. And you're seeing the largest insurer in the world, the federal government, moving to these models that have um, quality and and really, I'm going to say risk, <laughs> passed on to somebody else, you have to address right. all those things. Can you just explain this chart a little bit more? It went from 30% to 50% on alternative payment models. Is that what, it, in two years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's correct. I mean... Yeah, a tremendous movement. And this is, you know, this is Medicare. And again, uh, the reason I put Medicare up here is you're exactly right, Craig. That's the lever that the government uses to because it's the one they have total control over. And, you know, it's common sort of people policy, people say how goes Medicare, so goes eventually the rest of healthcare. So, um, so yes, it's exactly, this is like the Medicare Advantage programs, the, uh, uh, you know, and the Medicare uh, ACOs. Um, this is a deliberate attempt to move patients into uh, one of these uh, more advanced alternative payment models. And this trend, you know, is expected to continue. That's a pretty massive change from 30% in 2016 to 50% in, in right. over two years. That's, yeah. that's not gradual. <laughs> right. We're right. going that way. Part, and part of this, too, is, you know, people are seeing profits out of this. <laughs> not health yes. centers, but others, you know, so. Well, if they do it, if they do it in a data-driven model in a team-based right. environment, you can. Right. That's right. the point of this. We do have one question of um, about a, a specific example. Do you have a do you have an example of a health center that we can read about or that's doing this on the ground? Do you have somebody in your in your network that maybe folks can get sure. uh, written it up or something? Sure. But I hope I, you know, I hope I haven't, you know, mystified this. The attempt was to debunk it. So you probably could go to your own health center and find an example. Look for a performance improvement project that was successful, where you took some, you identified in the course of observation some problem. And uh, it could have been anything. It could even have been no-shows, or it could have been, you know, appointment fairs. Uh, I mean, appointment fairs. It could have been, you know, uh, not getting results on referrals. It could have been anything, right, where you use some data to then feed and translate back into a new process and continue to 
uh, to uh, uh, you know monitor it and demonstrate whether you actually achieved some improvement. It really, you know, this learning health system is really just a scale up of that. And the invitation here is for you is to think more broadly about what are opportunities uh, in uh, your your care delivery or in your practice to add that kind of discipline, to import that kind of discipline, and also to make sure that you're casting a, a wide net so again, back to my Dr. Raycott's example. I mean, that's a real life example that translates, that, that is like a national level impact where someone asking that question in the course of practice in an exam room, a family practitioner who was not a researcher, who was not any of that, just asked that question in the exam room. It's translated into now national efforts and tools that have improved the recognition of blood pressure. So, so it's just a plea to ask, you know, to encourage people to ask those questions and to use the data systems that you have in place to to help carry those forward. So, to your last slide, which was it is possible. So. Yep. Um, well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Rockman. Um, appreciate your time today. We are at the hour, top of the hour, so I do. Folks, if you would like to ask more questions, please just send them over to Mariah or I. Type them into the chat box for now, but um, we're going to be wrapping this up right now again with that evaluation piece at the end. Um, Fred was very nice to push our conference for this year, which is, again, um, at the end of July, July 29th through August 1st here in Washington, D.C., we have a tremendous lineup, actually. It's another rock star uh, lineup of folks of educational sessions and keynote speakers. Um, Going to be another great session and a terrific room rate at the Four Seasons, as we have discussed. Um, the the slides from today's presentation are available both in the in the handout box um, on this webinar, but we'll also be making the entire recording of the webinar available on our website. And our next uh, webinar in the series, our third of four, um, is next Tuesday, um, and it will be with Melissa Ryan of the Office of Shortage Designation going through the changes, the actually the process, and then the changes occurring in the shortage designation space at the federal level, um, and she is the she is the key of that whole thing, so we're very excited to have her as well. Um, thank you again, Fred, very much for your um, participation in our conference, for our participation in this webinar. Um, very proud of the fact that uh, we have such great presentations at our conference. And, uh, and thank you again for your time today, everybody. My pleasure. Thanks, all. Thank you.